So it's my pleasure to introduce you Isabel Guillon. Uh, Isabel uh, has been a very early adopter of machine learning research. She's one of the co-inventors of uh, support vector machines, which you probably all know about. And um, she was in the early uh, glory years of AT&T labs. And uh, afterwards, she decided to work uh, in the Bay Area as a consultant. And she's uh, these days working a lot in presenting challenges to the research community to help uh, research in various machine learning fields. So today, she's going to talk about uh, one particular challenge about causality. Thanks, Isabel. Thank you very much, Sami, and uh, thank you for you know, giving this opportunity of uh, talking here today about these uh, challenges in causality that uh, we are organizing. I think the slides are going to show on this side, so maybe um, people might want to move on that side to, to see better the slides. The title of my talk today, Challenges in Causality, reflects two types of challenges. One of them are the uh, competitions that we're organizing, and the other one, the uh, challenges that uh, us organizers are facing in trying to find means of assessing causal discovery algorithms, which is far from a trivial task. My collaborators in this endeavor are Konstantin Aliferis, Andrei Alisev, Gregory Cooper, and Peter Spiritus. So what in the first place is causal discovery? Well, what affects your health, the economy, climate changes? Those are some of the questions that are central in today's world. And also, which actions will have beneficial effects? So as soon as we're talking about actions in the prediction setting, we cannot ignore any more uh, causal relationships. But what in the first place is causality? Causality has many different meanings depending on the uh, field that you're looking at. For example, in science, uh, it is uh, well admitted that uh, one event might cause another if it occurs um, in, at a time which is uh, uh, sufficiently close that information can uh, circulate. And the limitation here is the speed of light. But even that is currently being challenged. In philosophy, uh, causality might have to do with um, uh, the uh, problem of um, um, uh, uh, free will. So free will is, is, is very hot in, in causality. Is, is our matter determining uh, our actions or, or not? In law, causality has to do with rela um, responsibility. In psychology, maybe uh, subconsciousness. In history, which leader is responsible for a, a particular turn in, in history? Or you know, would uh, some other leader have made a, a difference? In religion, who is you know, responsible for the creation of the, of the world, or et cetera? We adopt in this uh, presentation a more engineering point of view of causality that I will develop in the next few slides. And there is one of my favorite uh, definition of causality from Hindu philosophy. Cause is the effect concealed. Effect is the cause revealed. I find this very poetic and, and interesting. However, you know, from the engineering point of view, we need to get down to something more concrete uh, that we can evaluate in some way. And you also get on this slide an artistic rendering of causality in science. So now, an engineering point of view of causality. So at, at the risk of being reductionist, we are going down to something which is more measurable. In order to uh, define this notion of systemic causality, we need to assume that there are systems that can be isolated from the rest of the world. And uh, I made a, a, a small example to illustrate that. So imagine that um, uh, you have a one-year-old who is very fond of televisions and, and cartoons. And uh, you would like you know, to have some control over what your child is, is watching. So you purchased a very fancy remote controller. 
And that remote controller works only with very complex combinations of keys so that you don't run at risk that your one-year-old will turn off the TV by chance. Now, unfortunately, the manufacturer sent you the remote controller without the manual. So you're here and you really don't know how this thing works and you're you know, desperate and put it on the table, but your one-year-old grabs it. And she starts playing with the remote controller and eventually she figures it out. So you're like quite desperate. You're looking over her shoulder and she won't let go of this system. And the only thing you can do is to watch what she's doing. And eventually, you're the external agent on that system when your one year old you know, falls asleep, that's your chance now to turn off your TV set. Have you been able to learn from watching her which button or which combinations of buttons you need to press to turn off your TV set without waking her up? So that's the setting in which uh, we're thinking of having a system, which is in that case, the one year old and the remote controller, which has some dynamics of its own, which we don't know about, which we are able to observe and we want to perform a particular action to have a desired effect. And we want to predict what will be the effect of this action before we actually perform it. So in causality, usually people think you know, uh, that it is not possible to infer what causal relationships exist before you do yourself some experimentation. So if, you know, before you actually play with your remote control, you shouldn't be able to know what's going to be the effect of, of you know, dialing a particular combination of keys. But in this setting, you're not allowed to perform the experiments. You can only observe the system. And then you need to predict what will happen when you do something. We come from the uh, feature selection background, which is common in machine learning, where you have a target of interest, which is called Y. And this is our outcome. And you have many features that we call X here. And these are predictive variables. In feature selection, what you want to do is to find a combination of predictive variables that will allow you to predict as well as possible the desired outcome, Y. And there are some you know, economical reasons for that. Usually, it costs to, to measure those variables. So this is a motivation for selecting the smallest possible number of variables to make your predictions. Now, if you are in this machine learning setting, you don't care about whether your variables are causes or consequences of your desired outcome. So for example, in the medical domain, um, smoking might be a cause of lung cancer and coughing might be a consequence. And both could be predictive, but only acting on smoking might have you know, an effect on lung cancer. Distributing cough medicine wouldn't really help. So when we get into this field of causation, we are interested in the results of actions that are performed by external agents on the system. So we, don't, we no longer want to just predict what will happen when we let the system evolve according to its own dynamics. We want to predict what will happen if we interfere with the system by doing so-called manipulations by an external agent. And in that setting, some of the features that would have been predictive you know, in the natural uh, prediction setting will no longer be predictive. So we need to understand something of the inside of the system in order to do a good job in this causation, where causation means using causality to predict action. And uh, in our particular view of causation, we are interested in one particular outcome, so one particular variable y, that is what we want to um, what we want to measure the results on. So, for example, we're interested in um, measuring the uh, benefits on on health or on economy, and we have one particular metric of interest: uh, uh, is the GNP going to grow, or is you know the mortality of the population uh, going to be improved? So what's out there? We have a lot of available data. Continuously, day by day, you know, there are lots of recordings that are uh, being performed around the world, and data accumulates. Unfortunately, those data are what we call observational data. They're just being measured without doing any intervention on the system of interest. And 
The uh, inconvenient here with respect to determining causal relationships is that there, there is no real distinction that can be made between correlation and causality in observational data in most of the cases. So for example, you might be observing that there is a correlation uh, between uh, uh, smoking and uh, uh, the incidence of lung cancer. However, are you sure that smoking causes lung cancer? You would need to perform actual experiments like forcing people to smoke or forbidding them to smoke and randomize all the other variables in order to be sure that smoking is a cause of lung cancer. And that actually is an argument that has been used during the tobacco settlement. Um, the, uh, some lawyers um, put forward the argument that, well, there might be a common cause to both smoking and getting lung cancer. What about, for example, a genetic factor that will cause you to crave for nicotine and also cause lung cancer? In that case, uh, you could not distinguish just from observing uh, some, some uh, data just from analyzing some recorded data on, on populations that haven't, where there hasn't been a controlled experiment. Uh, unfortunately, controlled experiments, which are often needed to determine causality, are costly, and unethical, or infeasible. So organizing uh, uh, a campaign to discourage people to smoke or forbidding smoking in public places is costly. Forcing people to smoke would be unethical, and uh, completely preventing them from smoking would be almost infeasible. So in many cases, you can't perform experiments. So on this little cartoon, I'm, I'm illustrating also the fact that we have you know, this very hot problem right now about global warming. Well, we can't put the Earth in a test tube and, uh, and, and warm it up, right? So on this new slide, I'm uh, trying to illustrate the fact that there are now algorithms that allow you, to some extent, to discover causal relationships in data and in, in uh, observational data, so without performing actual experiments. So that is you know, the real value here, because we have a lot of observational data. So I'm showing you here a prototypical algorithm. And this is the only algebra you will see in my talk, but it's just you know, to convince you that this is real. And this algorithm is called the PC algorithm. It was introduced by uh, Spiritus and Glimmer in 1999. So consider three random variables, A, B, and C, which belong to a universe X of random variables. And V is a, a subset of X. First, you initialize uh, a graph that is completely fully connected and unoriented. So arrows in the graph will mean causal relationships. And then you're going to perform a number of steps to organize that graph into a causal graph. So the first kind of steps you're performing are tests of conditional independence. If two variables are conditionally independent, conditioned on any subset of other variables from this universe X, then you're going to cut the uh, connection between the two variables. Then you perform an additional step, which has to do with colliders. Um, here, this little bar here should be crossing here. In this collider step, you consider any triplets, A, B, and C of variables that are connected, A connected to C, C connected to B, but A not connected to B, okay? So if there is any subset um, uh, V that uh, um, is such that A is independent of B given V, then you, you um, don't consider that rule, but if there is no subset V considering uh, that satisfy this independence criterion, then you conclude that you should be orienting the arrows in this way. So in essence, uh, this says that uh, if you, know, you have this conditional dependency that happens between B and, and, and A, conditional dependency on using a subset containing C imposes that there is arrow pointings towards C. So this, these two uh, conditions are the basis for a lot of uh, uh, causal discovery algorithms. And then afterwards, you have still many 
uh, connections in the graph that are not oriented, and you try to complete the connections with some uh, heuristics that uh, are based on these rules of constraint propagation. If you have you know, a chain of causal relationships like that, and there is a, a, a link between A and C, then you orient the arrow in this way. And if you have a chain, and then there is a, a missing link here, then you add the arrow uh, that is pointing in that direction. So there are other uh, types of algorithms, of course. I was just uh, uh, trying to illustrate here the type of things that people are doing in this field. And there are quite a number of difficulties that people are facing in developing um, uh, useful and uh, efficient algorithms. First of all, people need to make a number of assumptions for these algorithms to be valid. And some of these assumptions are generally violated. One of the assumptions is causal sufficiency. As can be uh, shown, depending on the set of variables that you're considering, the causal relationships that you're trying to establish might change. So if you remove one variable or add one variable in your universe, this might change completely the relationship within the other variables that you can infer from these algorithms. So this is called causal sufficiency. You need to have enough variables so that you're sure that you can infer properly the right relationships between variables. Hidden variables are the nightmare of a causality algorithm. The uh, other assumptions that are very often made are these um, assumptions uh, of um, Markov uh, graphs and also of faithfulness that basically say that there is a correspondence between the graphical representation of your uh, causal relationships and the underlying distributions and all the uh, dependencies or independencies that can be uh, derived from analyzing your underlying distribution. Then other um, hypotheses are you know, very common, such as linear relationships with variables or Gaussianity of some of the distributions. So even if you have you know, overcome all these difficulties, you're still faced with some more problems. Some problems include overfitting. So assume now that you don't have anymore an infinite amount of training data. And many of the algorithms, they make the assumption that you have an infinite amount of training data. And even then, they have you know, a number of problems. But in reality, you have a limited amount of training data. And because of that, uh, uh, you need to take into account some error bar, some confidence on the causal relationships that you find. So this is what I call here a statistical complexity, taking into, into account finite sample sizes. And last but not least, we have algorithm efficiency problems. So this is what I refer to as computational complexity. You often have now thousands of variables and tens of thousands of examples, and many of the algorithms do not survive, you know, do not scale up to these uh, large problems. So this is you know, our point of start in organizing a challenge in causality. We want to see which algorithms survive all these difficult conditions on some, uh, on some sizable data sets. So we started this uh, project, which we, which we call Causality Workbench, which is introducing a number of challenging problems in causal discovery. And we think of it as a causality laboratory. What we ultimately want to achieve is that we want people to be able to experiment on uh, some model problems because uh, researchers in the, this field of causal discovery and in machine learning usually don't have the luxury of having their own wet lab or having you know, a, a laboratory to really experiment on, uh, on, on, on real systems. So we're going to make available to them artificial systems that are modeling real problems. And they'll be able to perform experiments on them and see how efficient their causal discovery algorithms are. To start you know, um, weeding the, uh, the problems, we have organized a, a first challenge. And it's not yet a causal discovery lab. It's uh, still uh, uh, problems that uh, um, are not in completely interactive. But we have uh, shopped for a number of problems. And our approach is to find problems that pose a real causal question, problems that are of real interest, uh, economic or uh, societal problems, problems that are hard to solve from the point of view of the algorithms, 
but yet are solvable. So we have some baseline methods that do better than chance. And uh, problems that are good benchmarks in the sense that we can get error bars that are small enough that we can distinguish between uh, the performance of two different algorithms. And I'm taking advantage here to introduce my collaborators. So Peter Spiritus, which, is, uh, uh, which has done a lot of work in uh, causal discovery, is interested in the fundamental aspects of causality. Uh, André Elisef, who uh, is more on the application side right now, is working uh, at, at IBM. Constantin Aliferis, who has been uh, working a lot on causal discovery algorithms and making them efficient. Uh, Gregory uh, Cooper, who is uh, uh, an expert on medical applications of causality. And uh, myself, who has been organizing several benchmarks uh, already on uh, machine learning. We came up now with three initial data sets, which are part of our first causality challenge. So let me uh, introduce you these data sets, which will illustrate the kind of things we're interested in. Each one has a given training set from which people are supposed to learn the causal relationships between variables, and three different test sets which have numbers 0, 1, 2. And the test set correspond to different types of manipulations that external agents have been making. In our setting, people need to learn only from observational data, that is from the natural distribution of the system, but then they are going to be tested on a different distribution, which is an unusual setting in machine learning. In machine learning, people usually think you know, of data as being IID, independently and identically distributed. Here, we violate this. We give them test data, which are, which are drawn from a different distribution corresponding to some manipulations by an external agent. So in the ragged data set, for example, we have a data which is genomic data. We have uh, variables that uh, correspond to gene expression coefficients. So for example, measuring the activity of genes in serum. And what we want to predict is whether people have lung cancer or not. So it's a classification problem with, from many variables, which are the, all these gene expression coefficients. And the goal is to find whether there are causal relationships between the gene expression coefficients and, and, and lung cancer, either uh, as uh, drug targets, so some of the genes might be in the end drug targets, or to monitor the activity of drugs. So some of the, the genes might be interesting biomarkers that allow you to monitor the activity of some drugs that has been administered to patients. Uh, in this case, we have so-called re-simulated data. So one of my colleagues, Constantin Aliferis, built a model. So he's been working for many years on a model of these uh, genomic uh, causes of lung cancer using real data. And then the model has been used to generate artificial data so we know the truth values of causal relationships, which are embedded in the model. And we propose to people uh, some uh, data from which they have to reconstruct the causal relationships of the model. In the second data set called SIDO, we have a different problem, which is a pharmacology, a pharmacology problem. Here, the features or variables are um, uh, are features of molecules, pharmaceutical molecules that might be good drugs. And so people in, in pharmacology have huge libraries of uh, uh, small molecules which have been used in the past as drugs. And these molecules have been tested against uh, the HIV virus in that case and have been tagged as active or inactive. And the question is that the uh, uh, chemical engineers would like to know which of the molecule features are interesting in order to get this activity so that when they design the next molecule, they will get the desired activity. So here we want these causal relationships between features of the molecule and activity and distinguish them from mere correlations. For example, is solubility really a cause of activity or is it just correlated with the activity but the real cause might be the presence of some group of atoms uh, in a particular arrangement? In the third problem we're looking at, now we're not looking at a biomedical application, but a, an application in, in econometrics, we would like to know which attributes are important to uh, earn more money. 
So we have census data, and we have uh, um, a variable that says whether people earn more or less than $50,000 per year. And we would like to know whether variables like uh, marital status, number of children, number of years of uh, uh, university studies are affecting or not the earnings. Um, potential actions that you know would follow if we knew the answer to those questions would be, are you going to send a few more years your children to college? Uh, but we don't want to experiment with that. We can't, or you know, uh, it's, it's too difficult. And we would like to know these causal relationships using only this observational data. We have a couple more uh, data sets that are toy data sets that are generated by small artificial models so that people can practice in the challenge. And people are getting online feedback from a website that we have been setting up. We do not give them the performance on the test set. So right now they have only XXX as answer to the different metrics that we're computing. But we give them partial feedback in terms of whether or not they are you know, top ranking or average or bottom ranking. So we give them quartile information. If they are in the top 25% of the people, the, their box is colored in green, then you know, it gets a grading of color. And if they are in the worst, uh, uh, models, then they get a, a red box. And this is sufficient motivation so that they keep making entries into the challenge. And they can get details on the various data sets by uh, pointing uh, on one of the uh, bars here, then they get some more details. So in the remainder of the talk, now that I've you know, laid the basis of what we want to do, I'm going to talk about what are our own challenges. Uh, why is it difficult to uh, benchmark causal discovery and what innovations we've done uh, to address these problems? So our challenges are finding good problems, good data, good metrics, challenge protocols and implementation. And I'll be talking about the first uh, three items here. We have a couple of uh, upcoming data sets that we're working on. One of them is conceptual and, and is uh, uh, artificially generating data that has some particular difficulties that are often overlooked by most algorithms. So I, I mentioned to you some of the assumptions that are usually made by uh, regular causal discovery algorithms. So this data set will make these algorithms fail. So it's, um, we have other real data sets. One of them is uh, another healthcare data set. And this one is introducing another type of difficulty that usually people don't take into account in uh, modeling uh, causal relationships. And that difficulty is that anything we can measure, we measure it via an instrument. And instruments are not perfect. So in essence, we never or rarely, we rarely have access to causes of, um, of outcomes of interest. What we have access to is measurements that are derived from these causes. So in essence, we always see effects, right? Because measurements are effects of what we are interested in. And because of that, we might draw the wrong conclusions. So we are setting up this data set in which there are instrument measurement artifacts that people have to take into account to, the, to draw the, the, real, the good conclusions. We have another data set that looks into uh, the uh, importance of taking into account the timing of events. So in that case, uh, we're looking at a marketing problem in which uh, uh, product sales are being monitored over a period of time. And you have seasonality effects and many other effects that need to be taken into account. And we're looking into introducing more and more data sets in, in a wide variety of applications, psychology, epidemiology, neuroscience, security, sociology, climatology, the internet, and um, ecology. And we would like very much that you know, people like you help us identifying good new applications of these algorithms. And if you want to contribute data, what characteristics, uh, the characteristics we're, we're seeking in, uh, in good data sets are uh, that the data need to be not confidential. We need to have a large number of samples, a large number of variables. The data preferably need to contain both observational and experimental uh, samples. 
But if you can't meet all these conditions, we can still have, yes, question? Uh, when you say large number of samples and variables, what's the scale that you, the other data sets are on? The ones that we have presently? Yeah, like just rough quantifications of large numbers. So let me go back and then show you again the tables. In the data sets we presently have, um, we've been looking at numbers of uh, uh, examples. And here we, we're mostly interested in the number of test examples in order to be able to really benchmark yeah. the uh, uh, algorithms. And like they are in the, the tens of thousands. So the, the more the better here. We limit it a little bit because we get then huge volumes of data and some people would be limited by just manipulating huge volume of data. And those numbers of, of examples give us reasonable error bars. So tens of thousands, right? And in numbers of variables, the reason why we want a large number of variables is because um, if we have, say, for example, one of two variables, then you're assessing causal relationships only among one of two trials, right? So, so you can't get error bars, good error bars in that respect. So we have in the at least hundreds uh, of variables. Now, what I wanted to, uh, to say next is that even if your data does not satisfy all these requirements, we have means of generating semi-artificial data. So we, we welcome also data that has fewer number of variables or not as many samples. If we don't have enough samples, we can make models that will then generate samples. And if we don't have enough variables, we can add extra artificial variables that will be, uh, we'll be plunging the real system into a larger uh, semi-artificial system, OK? So we've been doing both in, uh, in this challenge we're presently organizing. And uh, in the next few slides, I'm going to explain how we assess the performance of causal discovery algorithms with, with our new methods. So we have two types of, of ways of assessing causal discovery algorithms. One is very goal-oriented, and that is via the fulfillment of an objective. So the objectives can be uh, twofold. They can be of making prediction of uh, actions in the future, or they can be uh, looking back in the past, explaining what happens. So what if we had not launched this advertisement campaign? Would we have also gained this 10% in sales or not? So this is what people refer to as counterfactual. And the second type of metrics we're having uh, are directly assessing causal relationships with respect to their existence, their strength, and their degree. So to you know, um, put that again in context, um, a lot of what's being done in the causal discovery uh, algorithm domain does only the first type of assessment. People assume that they can define in some way what causal relationships are, and they have some truth value that they found in some way, right? And so they, for example, they generate data with a, a Bayesian network, and then they try to reconstruct the network from which the data has been drawn. Right? That's typical of what people do in, in this field. Uh, here, we have a different view because we don't want to be biased by a particular way of generating data. Data could have been generated by a system which is not a directed acyclic graph, like, like what you know, people usually assume. Real systems are very complex, full of feedback loops, full of variables that you never observe. Right? And we think, we think that this is the real power of causal modeling. The real power of causal modeling is not to reconstruct a known Bayesian network. It is to take a real system with all its complexity, all its hidden variables, all you know, uh, its feedback loops, all its you know, non-stationary behavior, and be able to build a causal model that will allow you to perform actions that will have desired effects. And this is what we as human we're facing with you know in our everyday life we're interacting with complex systems for example uh, our fellows or friends right we are not able to model them perfectly but still to some extent we're able to predict what will happen if we do this or that so we have our internal causal models of virtually everything we're interacting with 
And so we have these metrics that are indirect, that assess how well we are doing with respect to modeling causality via the fulfillment of an objective. Because we know that there is necessarily a tie between causality and the prediction of actions between be, being performed. If there is an external agent that who is tweaking the system, the only way you can predict what will happen is by having some notion of causality. So what are examples of objectives? Well, in uh, medicine and epidemiology, maximize life expectancy, maximize drug efficacy, minimize contagion. In economy and marketing, maximize the uh, gross, gross national product, um, minimize, uh, maximize sales, sorry. <laughs> and uh, for example, minimize uh, churn rate, which is a very uh, popular application for the uh, cell phone companies who constantly have you know, people switching from one company to the other and they need to modify their uh, marketing policies. So everything has to do with issuing a new policy in order to influence uh, some target is uh, an example of what we're interested in. So in the next few slides, I'm going over some examples uh, that are uh, just toy examples to illustrate how things work. So here we made a small causal graph that illustrates this problem of lung cancer. And we have a number of variables in green that are in the neighborhood of lung cancer. And in, in the uh, jargon uh, of the field, people refer to those variables as the uh, Markov, Markov blanket. Those, are, those include the direct causes, the direct effects, and some direct causes of the direct effects. The reason for having you know, these other variables like uh, allergy, which is neither a cause nor a consequence in that uh, set of variables uh, that are in the neighborhood here, is because allergy helps you drawing conclusions from coughing. If you see somebody coughing, you can't really conclude anything about whether or not the person has lung cancer unless you know whether the person is coughing because of an allergy. If it's during hay fever and people are coughing, you can't really rely on, on that variable to predict lung cancer, okay? So you need to know something about allergy. So if you know these variables in green, well, those variables in green, they screen you from the other variables here in the sense that Lung cancer is independent of all the variables in yellow here, given the variables in green, given this Markov blanket. So if you do prediction in a usual IID setting, you know, in a usual predictive manner where you don't have intervention of your, on your system, a pretty reasonable way of proceeding is to use those variables in, rain, in green as predictors for your target variable. Well, not so anymore if you're performing interventions on your system. So here, I'm uh, circling in red a number of variables on which we're acting. So assume that there is an external agent that can you know, uh, force people to wash their hands, uh, force people or prevent people from smoking, um, you know, force people to lie in bed to get rested, right? perform these actions that that force the system to behave in a certain way. Now, because of these actions of this external agent, these variables in red, they are now disconnected from their natural causes. So if I go back to the previous graph, you know, there were more arrows here. There are some arrows that are gone because since we're manipulating those variables, they are disconnected from their natural causes. As a result, the Markov blanket is now changed. This variable here is no longer part of the Markov blanket. So what we're asking people to do is to learn from the training data these are relationships. And then we're telling them, well, now we're going to be manipulating these variables in red. Tell us which ones are still going to be predictive in the test data. Well, in that case, the right answer is that this variable that remain green will still be predictive, but this one will not. Now see, there is here a subtlety that uh, this, the variable smoking, which is a cause of lung cancer, is still predictive. Whereas this one, which is a consequence, is no longer predictive. So in doing these manipulations, we always make sure that we don't manipulate the target variable. So the target variable always remains connected to its natural causes, right? That part of the system never gets changed or, you know, 
messed up with. Hence, in particular, if we would manipulate all the variables, then none of them would be predictive except for the direct causes. OK? So if I tell you we manipulated all the variables, then the natural thing to, for you to do is to take into account only the direct causes to make your predictions of the uh, uh, outcome. Now, how do we uh, then assess how well people are doing with respect to discovering these causal relationships without having to give them a definition of causality? So this has been our, ex our exercise because since it's almost impossible to give a definition of causality that encompasses all the notions that people have been you know, proposing in the literature, we want to have this goal-driven causality that's only defined via the manipulations or via the, ex the interventions of external agents. So what we do is that uh, because we have access to the system that uh, generated the data in that particular case, we can define the variables that we know are going to be predictive of the target. But we don't really ask people to tell us which are causes or effects or, or whatever. Uh, we just uh, uh, you know, select those variables that are going to be predictive, and we ask people to return a subset of variables which are used by the system to make predictions. So hopefully, if they have optimized their objective, then the subset of variables that they have selected are going to contain a large number of the most predictive variables. right? So we ask them to either order them or not order them. But anyways, we want to find whether they have in the top ranking variables those variables that are of interest. And then we compute a score, which is a function of the subset they've returned and the subset of variables that we know are you know, uh, the truth values of the good variables that, that they needed to find. And then we'll be able to correlate uh, this uh, causal relevance with the performance on predicting the target, right? the target variable. So you remember, for example, we wanted to predict lung cancer. And so one, one thing we might want them to optimize is the error rate on classifying patients into uh, healthy or having cancer. That would be the objective. Now they need to perform these tasks now in manipulated data. And we have to see whether they, they perform the feature selection correctly. So they you know, discard variables that are no longer predictive because of manipulation. And we'll be able then to correlate how, well their, how good their feature set is compared to how well they're predicting uh, the target variable lung cancer in the context of these manipulations. So that's our approach that ties causality to pursuing a given objective. Now, unfortunately, a lot of the data we have is purely observational data. So everything I've been talking to you, uh, you know, before works only if we have artificial data sets that are generated by models for which we know the truth value of the causal relationships. Any real system that we can just observe but don't, you know, cannot open and, and uh, look you know, uh, inside what are really the connections between the different variables, any real system does not give us the truth values of the causal relationships. And in that case, the only thing we can you know, do uh, is to have uh, observational data. And we can't perform real manipulations. So if we can't perform real manipulations, we can't provide to people manipulated test data. Then therefore, everything breaks down. Everything I've been talking to you about before breaks down. Um, so we found a, a new means of using purely observational data and still assess causal relationships. So with all the limitations that this new method has, it is very powerful because we have a lot of situations like that, a lot of situations in which we will never be able to perform experiments, right? So and we still would like to uncover causal relationships because we want to know, for example, if we limit the emissions of CO2, will that have an effect on global warming? Our methodology plunges our real system into a larger artificial system. 
So now assume that the small system that I've been talking to you about, this, this graph here, is a real system. It's not, you know, this artificial system that I've been mentioning. But we don't know it, right? It's, it's hidden. So what we're going to do is that we're going to add more variables. And those variables, we call them probes. And they are derived from the real variables. And the um, links here, they are known to us. We have, you know, created these artificial variables using some artificial system. And uh, uh, because of that, because we have control over that, we're going to be able to, to manipulate these probes. And thanks to this uh, um, particular uh, setting, we're going to be able to draw some conclusions about how well the causal discovery al uh, algorithms are performing without having to manipulate the real system here. In particular, what we can do is to manipulate all the probes. And if we manipulate all the probes, we disconnect them from their uh, causes that are drawn from the real system. And so if uh, causal discovery algorithms uh, you, uh, use you know, such relationships between real variables, the uh, target variable, and, and the probes to make predictions, this will fail when we, uh, when we manipulate the probes. So here is the way we use this. We take real data, we add probes, and then we let the participants of the challenge know that we have manipulated all the probes. So they should conclude that they cannot rely on the probes to make predictions of the target variable. And because all the probes are non-causes of the target, right, the, the arrows, they always go in this direction from some of the real variables to the probes. The probes are never causing any of these variables. Because of that, a reasonable strategy is to exclude from the set of predictive variables all the variables that might be, co might be consequences of the uh, target. So you need to adopt this worst case scenario in which you can't rely on any consequences of the target because all the probes are consequences of the target. In this way, we are using these artificial manipulations to assess how well the causal discovery algorithms discover causes of the target. And it can be shown that when we use you know, the uh, scoring using the probes, what we can compute is an F-score that uses a neg as negative class the probes, which are all non-causes and are all manipulated, and as positive class the other variables, which may or may not include causes or non-causes. So the F-score you know, assesses how well you separate the probes from the other variables. And what we really would want to compute is an R-score that separates the causes from the non-causes. And it can be shown that asymptotically, for an infinite number of, of uh, probes, the F-score is uh, linearly related to the R-score. So it gives us a good model selection criterion to assess the performance of causal discovery algorithms. So I've reached you know, the, uh, uh, the end of uh, this story. And uh, in conclusion, I, please you know, play with this. Uh, try our first challenge, learn and win. We're going to have uh, a workshop, travel grants from you know, the top ranking participants, and uh, some proceedings in the Journal of Machine Learning Research, a best paper award, some prizes. And uh, the uh, prize you win is going to be multiplied by the number of data sets on which you have won. So there is an incentive to try many of these data sets. And uh, one of the reasons for me to be here is both to encourage you to try to enter this challenge and learn about causality and also um, try the best ideas you have, but also to contribute new problems. Because these challenges are a great opportunity to have your problem solved. And even working on creating a data set and on phrasing your problem and putting it into the set of the challenge is a big step towards solving it. So if you join us you know, and, and try to contribute new problems, I think this is a great opportunity for us to have your problem solved by dozens of uh, research groups for free, essentially. Thank you very much for your attention. Do we have questions?
Uh, is this the first such challenge that uh, you guys have managed, or have you already learned something new from a previous challenge? No, this is actually the fourth challenge that, uh, that we're organizing. The other ones were a lot easier um, than, than this one, because the, here the uh, problems are very difficult to, um, to put in a setup in which we can actually benchmark. The, uh, the algorithms, right? Uh, particularly this non-IID data is, is difficult. Um, let me give you an example. In one of the first challenges we organized on uh, feature selection, uh, we had a setup in which uh, people could pro uh, provide the results online for a small subset of the test data called validation set. And we would give them results on this validation set. Then the final benchmarking was done on a much larger test set. But because the data were IID, we could give them you know, test data that was distributed similarly as the validation data. Here we can't do that because we would inform people a lot about the distribution on test data if we would give them information about how well they're doing on the subset of the test data. So here we had you know, to modify our protocol and give them this quartile information about the real test data. So we have to work a lot on, on protocols. So there are many other uh, aspects. And I don't want to bore you with that, but we can have a, a discussion about it afterwards. Uh, we uh, learned a lot of things from past challenges and which keeps you know, us to uh, want to organize more uh, challenges. Often, the conclusions are counterintuitive. In the uh, feature selection challenge, we thought that uh, space, space dimensionality reduction is a big element in improving classification performance or, or prediction performance. As it turns out, this is not true. Uh, today's algorithms are very powerful uh, in dealing with large dimensional IG data. There is regularization that harnesses the, the, you know, the, the problem of uh, uh, overfitting. And uh, most often, algorithms perform better if you take the entire feature set as an input. If you don't prune first the feature set, pruning first the feature set is costly in number of examples that you use to do that in training. Right? So that was one of the outcomes of the first feature selection challenge. If you don't need to do feature selection for some other reason, like for some economic reason, for example, because it's costly to measure features, then probably you don't want to do it. In um, other challenge we've, we've been organizing, uh, we've had also interesting conclusions. So for example, um, people have been uh, wondering for many years whether cross-validation is the best way of doing model selection. And uh, if you, you know, pull people and ask them, you know, if you had the gun on your head and needed to answer, are you going to use cross-validation or are you going to use structural risk minimization or statistical testing or whatever other method to uh, do a model selection, everybody will say, well, I'll be using cross-validation. Uh, as it turns out, it's, it's true that this is, this is the best way of going. But there is an even, even better way uh, of uh, doing model selection than, you know, uh, the uh, usual uh, K-fault uh, um, uh, cross-validation, uh, and it is to regularize cross-validation. So you can go to the next level and do regularized cross-validation. So that, that's one of the hot topics now in, uh, in model selection and uh, has been verified in, in, in our challenge. Now, the last challenge that we organized was a lot of fun. We called it agnostic learning versus prior knowledge. And we gave people data sets in several representations to see how much they could win by adding domain expert knowledge to their system in order to solve given tasks. And there, well, the interesting thing is that uh, real domain expert knowledge usually is more harmful than useful. <laughs> so real experts usually don't do a very good job because they're kind of opinionated. In a way, they have you know, a too strong prior about what they think is going to work, and they don't rely enough on data. And so they often go the wrong way and don't you know, <laughs> recuperate from that. Uh, on the other hand, completely agnostic learning is not as good as a little bit of not real domain knowledge, but um, uh, some common sense knowledge that you can, can put in based on you know, the type of data that you have. So um, things like you know, um, uh, 
uh, removing some variables because you know they would be useless or um, using or not using some higher order interactions or if you, you know that you have images using the, the fact that you have two dimensional relationship between variables. So very, you know, simple high level kind of, you know, uh, uh, knowledge that can help. But true domain knowledge usually hurts more than, than, uh, than helps. So we, we hope in this particular challenge also to have some uh, surprises and, and discover some interesting things. Um, the setup is, is new both to machine learning people and to causal discovery knowledge people. Um, both communities haven't been talking that much together, so we hope by having this new setup that people would be working on, you know, on, on that problem uh, in a more uh, unified way. But there is opportunity for both community to contribute uh, you know, without that much background uh, knowledge already, there is, there is a lot to learn for both community because this setup is, is kind of novel. So you asked uh, for us to forward, I don't know, uh, ideas for new domains to add to epidemiology, climatology, ecology, yeah. et cetera. So one of them, which is obviously worked on a lot but would be interesting and for which there's plenty of data is uh, spam, spam filter. So yeah. you have the these right. two sets. Yeah. Uh, the next one, I guess, would be sort of statistical machine translation. So you have, let's say, in Canada, French, every, everything's in French and in English. So um, given a training set, can you then turn this English into some French? So translation, basically. Uh, so, so the first problem that you mentioned, mm -hmm. I've, I've been thinking of, uh, and, and I can think of one way that, that we think that would be interesting. I discussed to Sammy about it. He, he thinks that you know I'm being the devil there because the problem would be not <laughs> not to work for spam filtering, but <laughs> to discover to, uh, how spam filters behave. <laughs> so this is this is uh, the problem of the spammers. They want to know uh, they want to reverse engineer the spam filters and find what sh what set of variables make it that my message is going to be discarded. Well, in well they're spam. pretty good, right? If you see some of the stuff at the bottom of your messages, so uh, who knows where these guys are. Right, Coming right. From. So I, I do think it's a very good uh, model problem because there we can de devise yeah. uh, experiments that we can actually carry out for real yeah. on systems that are out there and that we don't, you know, there is no moral or, right. or you know, ethical problem with performing these right. experiments. Uh, the other problem, uh, the second problem you mentioned, I, I don't really understand what the causal question is. So uh, basically an English word causes a French word if you have the parallel text. Or you can think of it in this way. Why would the English word cross the French word or, uh, uh, so, uh, instead of the opposite? It's, it looks like a, well, an equivalence relationship rather than a causal relationship. Uh, it's not really because it's not one to one. But um, so, yeah, but you can take it. You can take it both ways. But let's say that my problem is then to turn some other English into French. Then I think about it this way. Um, and when you do do statistical machine translation, you will run it in both directions. You can't run it. You can't think of it as one-to-one. -one. OK. Yeah. I'd be very interested in talking to you about it. And then the final thing, which is um, less germane to Google but more fun, is uh, something like Saddam Futures. So when Saddam Hussein was still alive, uh, you could um, go bet on online uh, places like in Ireland. They say, OK, the chance that Saddam will be killed by this date. And then crunch that with oil price. Yep. spikes or oil future yep. spikes or anything like this this is absolutely. a ton of fun yeah, absolutely we, we've been we've been actually uh, thinking about that the, in the European community has a program that is extracting from text events so whenever we have you know a stream of events and they have it you know uh, in uh, in XML format uh, we can then try to figure out whether we have cause effect relationships between events that have been extracted from Google text. Google Trends or Google News right they have the yeah. a word on every spike like a, a yeah. an event that happens Yeah that, I would be extremely interested in in uh, in working on that, those kind of applications if you have data Do we have other questions So, so other, other uh, you know, I've been playing with Google Ads before, before I came here. And uh, uh, from the user point of view, I see Google Ads as, as this uh, complex system with which I would like to have an understanding of what cause-effect relationships are. So 
uh, from the user point of view, it would be helpful for me to have a simple causal model that will help me getting more efficient campaigns. There are already existing wizards that are uh, made available to uh, people who place ads, uh, but they, they are kind of uh, opaque. Uh, and uh, they don't allow you to uh, very quickly figure out a strategy on how to optimize your ads. So thinking, you know, maybe that would be also an avenue for causal uh, discovery systems. But, you know, think about it in, in, you know, in the back of your mind and, and send me an email if you have uh, other ideas you can work on. Okay. Thanks, Isabel.